I want to talk to you today about fitness. I want to talk to you about a new sermon series that we are kicking off today, and the name of this series is The Power of Spiritual Fitness. In a person's development, things that are important for their development are nutrition. You are what you eat. Sleep, exercise, a safe home environment, and a supportive family. We've been talking all year about grace, about growth, about growing in grace. And so a theme that we have this year is a theme on growth. And so one of the areas that allows us to grow is our fitness level. Specifically for this series, we're going to look at our spiritual fitness. As we continue our theme on growth for the year, the next thing I want to look at is the importance and impact of fitness on your growth and development. Our foundational scripture for this series is 1 Timothy 4, 7 and 8. But reject profane and old wives' fables and exercise yourself towards godliness. For bodily exercise profits a little, but godliness is profitable for all things, having promise of the life that is now and of that which is to come. But please don't misinterpret the scripture or what I'm saying about physical fitness. I'm, I'm not saying physical fitness is not good. I'm not saying that you shouldn't focus on being physically fit. Physical fitness is, in fact, very good. And, and, and the thing about it is, is that just with your physical fitness, it's not going to get you into heaven. Lifting weights, cycling, Pilates, running, treadmills, stepping machines, they're all good, but they won't get your name into the book of life. To the extent of doing God's will and walking in your purpose, these are the things that, when it comes to the physical exercise, those things profit very little. When we talk about walking in our purpose, it doesn't really matter whether or not you can run a four-minute mile. If you're talking about walking in your purpose, it doesn't really matter if you can do 10 pull-ups. Those things don't matter when it comes to walking in your purpose. But the scripture is relative because it's, the scripture actually says that bodily exercise profits a little. But don't take that to mean that you're not to, to exercise. Don't take that to mean that you should not get out and, and work out and, 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 and uh, ensure that you are working your body out. That scripture is relative. It's relative to the impact and importance of spiritual fitness as compared to physical fitness. So don't leave here and say that House of Light Church doesn't believe in taking care of God's temple. Don't, don't go out with that message. To the contrary, not only do we believe in taking care of the temple, but we have our tip-top temple ministry that meets the second and fourth Saturday of every month at 5 o'clock at Evergreen Nature Preserve. Be there. But for the purposes of growth and development in this series, we're going to talk about spiritual fitness. Now, in this series, we're going to talk about four different areas of uh, spiritual fitness. We're going to talk about attendance at church. We're going to talk about speaking in tongues. We're going to talk about studying and sharing God's word. And we're going to talk about service to God and the community. While doing research for this series, I read the following from a blog from a pastor in Africa. It says, God doesn't want you to have a super-built body and be flabby spiritually. Therefore, you must exercise your spirit. You must engage in spiritual exercise, which, unlike physical exercise, has a promise both for this life and for the life to come. So the question then is, how do you exercise yourself spiritually? It is simply by engaging in spiritual activities, such as going to church regularly praying in tongues consistently, studying God's Word, and sharing it with others, and serving in any capacity in the church of God. So that's a blog that I read while I was doing the research on this. So with your permission, I'm going to use the items listed in that blog as the central items for spiritual fitness. They're not the only ones. There are a number of things that you can do to get your spiritual fitness where it needs to be. But for the purposes of this, I'm going to use those, if it's okay with you. Regular church attendance, speaking in tongues, studying and sharing God's word and serving in the church. These are going to be the, the primary themes for the next four weeks on which we're going to focus. So for today, let us kick off the series by talking about fitness tip, fitness tip number one, church attendance 
or coming together. For my entire life, I've been an avid Oklahoma Sooner fan. However, I had not attended a game since 1988. However, a couple of years or so ago, as a special gift, my beautiful angel gave me, uh, she flew us to Dallas, Texas, to actually watch an OU game in person. I was in heaven. I was absolutely in heaven. We went, we went to the game, and for the first 30 minutes or so, I, I really thought I was an OU fan. But it turns out after about 30 minutes, I realized I wasn't actually an OU fan. I was actually an OU TV fan. There was a difference. While I followed the team literally since I was in elementary school, I literally never miss a game ever. Every year, I will watch every single OU game, and not only will I watch it, I have to be there at kickoff. I just feel like if they're going to have a good game, that Ken Gordon has to watch them kick the ball off. I, 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 you're laughing, but I feel that way. I really do. And when I don't catch it, there's something not right about the game for me. But what I recognized is that even though I thought I was an OU fan, the truth of the matter is, is I was really a TV fan. Because what I didn't understand is that when you, when you are really an OU fan and you go to the game, at the beginning of every single game when they get ready to kick off, every OU fan stands up and does this. I had no idea. I'm at home. I'm watching the game. I need to be there for kickoff, but I didn't recognize that everybody was doing this because I'm looking at the game on the field. And so we're sitting there in Dallas, Texas a few years ago, I'm this super avid, I mean, literally 50-year fan, and everybody is standing up like this, and Leslie looks at me eating my hot dog, and she goes, are you going to stand up? <laughs> and I was like, why? <laughs> because I didn't know. I, I didn't know that, that for OU, that when somebody says to you when you're walking going to the bathroom or you're walking going to the concession stand, when they say to you, boomer, the correct response is sooner. I didn't know that because I'm at home by myself. And so nobody says boomer to me at home. So when they said boomer to me, I went, uh-huh. Boomer. I'm like, yeah, go. I didn't know. I didn't know these things because I was a TV fan and didn't understand the norms, the power, the excitement, and the energy of coming together like other like-minded people. The same is true in the church. Can you stay at home and just watch church? Yeah, you can. Can you stay at home and just watch the preacher? Sure, you absolutely can. Can you stay at home and have a relationship with God? Yes, you absolutely can. But when you only stay at home, you miss the power and the connection of being around other like-minded people. When you only stay at home, you miss being strengthened by those who are on the same journey. Hebrews 10 and 25 says, Not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. So even in the Word of God, the Word of God understands that there's something about coming together and being around like-minded people that allows you to have a level of energy, that allows you to have a level of connection, that allows you to understand that you're on the same team and there's a certain camaraderie about that. When you only stay at home and do church, you miss essential encouragement. There are times when I am at home watching OU play, and I am a quiet fan. When OU is playing in my household, everybody... My children, when they were growing up, my wife and our dog, they know that if OU is on, please don't talk to me. There's a commercial coming, please. Please don't ask me questions yet. I'm focusing. I need to understand, I need to, I need to take it all in because I, I really need that concentration to know exactly what the tight end is doing and what play they're running and who made the tackle. When they score, I don't jump up and root and holler. I'm going, okay, all right, now don't let the other team score. 
and I'm literally on pins and needles the entire game. It doesn't matter how far ahead they are because I'm thinking about they're, they're, they're going to get lax all of a sudden. The other team's going to catch up, and then they're going to lose. See, there's no one else in there to encourage me when I'm down like that. When I'm looking at it and thinking the worst, I don't have anybody that's rooting going, yeah, well, let's root them on, and let's make sure that they don't do a letdown. Let's get excited. Let's, let's give them that energy. I'm not there. I'm just kind of like, please don't, 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 don't mess up. Please, please, please don't drop the, don't, don't drop the ball. Please don't fumble, whatever you do. And the same thing is in church. When you're at home by yourself, you don't have anybody there to, to, to give you encouragement, anybody there to, to kind of nudge you and say yes, and that's the way it is. And if you all will notice, one of the things you'll notice about me is that we started the church in 2016 in Burlington, New Jersey. Then we moved in 2018 to Birmingham, Alabama. And then we moved in 2022 here to Charlotte. You can ask any member in any of those churches, and no one has ever heard me say this, turn to your neighbor. I don't do that, ever. You've never heard me say, touch your neighbor. Oh, no. No, see, spirits jump. And I'm not, mm -mm, I'm not touching some people sitting next to me. Because I, mm -mm. And so I don't tell you to do that, right? But there's something about being there together where, you, where you're with someone who they can, say, they can turn to you and go, that's a sure word right there. Yeah, that, that, that's true what he just said. Being around other people who can encourage you, and, and not only that, sometimes you come to church, and how many of you know sometimes you come to church and you're just not there? Sometimes you just don't feel it. Sometimes it's been a long week. Sometimes you have been through things. Sometimes you went through things. Sometimes somebody that morning did something to you. Sometimes you just need a friendly smile. Sometimes you need somebody to just, to just let you know, hey, brother, it's good to see you. Hey, sister, it's good to see you. I'm so glad you pressed your way. How many of you know sometimes coming to church is a press? There's a, there's a lot of people, there's a lot of uh, uh, people who are preachers who have to preach on Sunday morning, and there's this thing about their spouse that says, if you have an issue, please don't talk to me about it Sunday before I got to preach. Please. Good friend of mine said to me that he and his wife had an agreement. It didn't matter how, what it was or how bad it was, don't bring it up before I got to preach on Sunday. Because there's something about how people can vex you on Sunday on your way to church or trying to get there to get connected. And what you all may or may not know, and, and I'm actually I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to err on the side of you probably do know it. You know there's some Sundays when you come in here when Leslie's mad at me. Y'all know it. <laughs> you, 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 you know, you can tell she, she's not her normally bubbly self. There are those days when somebody broke the code and, and spoke anyway. There are those days when somebody said something they probably shouldn't have said. It probably wasn't the right time. But sometimes just walking into the church and seeing another brother or another sister can lift you above that and make you feel like, Okay, it's going to be all right. So there's something about coming together that, that gives you a level of encouragement. But what exactly is it about coming together? What exactly is it about assembling yourselves? To answer that, I just want to remind you about one thing. For those of you who don't think that there's something about Hebrews 10 and 25 and assembling yourselves together, then I'm just going to hearken you back to COVID when we were all sheltering in place. You remember how in the beginning of it, when everybody was wanting them to let us shelter in place, you were wanting to work from home. You were like, yes, I get to shelter in place. But how many of you know that after a little while, it got old? How many of you knew after a little while, you wanted to go to a restaurant? Some of you were even, uh, even, willing, even willing not to have a mask and go to a restaurant. Some of you were willing not to have a K95 mask. Some of you were willing to just do a little, a little cloth across your face and try to act like that was going to be okay. Why? Because, because you got to a point where you begin to crave the, 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 uh, the assembling, you begin to crave the company, you begin to crave being around, being around other people. There's something to that, y'all. And maybe prior to 2020, if I would have preached this sermon, you might not have understood. You might have been like, well, I don't see the big deal. But there is a big deal. 
Even right now, there are still far-reaching effects uh, that people have from those couple of years not being able to engage with one another. Leslie works for a company where, where for years they have allowed their people to work remotely. But now all of a sudden they're calling all their people back. They're literally building buildings. I mean, paying millions of dollars to build buildings so that people can have offices to go to because there's something about when you can't assemble together that it affects you mentally. Do you not know that one of the cruelest punishments they can give to someone in, in, um, in prison is solitary confinement, being by yourself with no one else? And that's why it hurts me in my heart when I hear people say, I don't need anybody. It hurts me in my heart when I, people, when I hear people try to act like that, that, that uh, being around others is not important to them or trying to act like they don't care what other people think. We do care, and it does matter. There's something about the relationships, and COVID reminded us of that. If for no other reason, if you are able, you should be running to church every Sunday post-COVID. As much as all of us whined and complained about COVID keeping us in, many of us couldn't even go for walks sometimes because they wanted us to shelter in place. At that particular time, I worked for a company, and I had somebody who worked directly who reported to me who lived in Austria. And in and, and, and the country of Austria, they would not even allow them to leave their homes and go walking outside. You had to have, literally, you had to have governmental permission to walk outside. And so people were like sneaking out and like trying to walk around the block real quick. Or they were, they were taking their dog out for, 20, you know, for walks 20 times a day just so they could get out. Y'all, there's something about fellowship. There's something about being around one another. There's, there's just something about, of, of, about being together. There was a poet and a cleric. His name is John Donne. And he famously wrote something that we've all heard. And it was him who came up with the term, no one is an island. I don't care who you are, we all need each other. You gain strength from one another. You gain perspective from one another. How many of you know that there are times when you're thinking about things and your, your thoughts are just wrong? My mama calls it stinking thinking. And you need to be around other people so that they can help you g gain perspective. Sometimes when you're by yourself, you can whip yourself into a froth and have things all messed up. And have the whole world being against you and everybody doesn't like you and nobody wants to be around you and, and, and everybody feels a certain kind of way. And then you, go to, you get around people and you understand that's in your head. And you need to be around people so people can help you understand that that's not the way that they think about you. So gathering together, coming together as humans, we need others. We need close relationships. Our personal and emotional well-being, both physical and emotional, are tied up in the quality of our relationships and personal connections. How many of you know that the disruption of a personal relationship can wreak havoc in your life? How many of you know that breaking up with someone is almost akin to dying? Sometimes you're with a person and, and you think that that's the person you're supposed to be with and everything is good and everything is great. And then you break up with that person. Y'all only going together for three weeks. And you break up with the person and, and you feel like you're ready to die. Take me home now, Lord. I just, I don't know what I'm going to do without John. I just, I don't, you, you were dating four days. And now all of a sudden you just, you, you can't live life. But relationships do that to you. And, and by the way, when that happens after that breakup of three weeks, Lord, don't, don't find that song. You know that song that reminds you of that person? And then you sit there and play it over and over and over again. <laughs> and you begin to cry and think about everything that happened with that person that went wrong in the past three weeks. And how are you, Lord, going to live? Relationships matter, y'all, and the disruption of relationships hurt. It hurts so bad. And some people, it hurts them so bad until it makes them want to become a hermit, where they just shut themselves off from the world. But let me just tell you this. The other area where it hurts is when you have church hurt, and something happens at a church, 
and people don't treat you a certain way or don't do right by you or something. We have one of our, one of our members, his, name, his brother Clifford, hey, Brother Clifford, uh, who shared with us that he went to this church in Birmingham, and they treated him so bad. It happened at a time when Sister Leslie and I were out of town. And so we were, at that particular time, we were out of town, and so we didn't have church. And so he chose to go to a different church, and he got there, and they treated him so badly. I mean, I mean just, they made him feel literally, according to him, like just the scum of the earth. His words, not mine. Um, and he was like, I'll never, ever go back to that church ever again. There's something about going to a place where you expect to be received well, and then you're not. That can hurt. It's almost like when you, when you, when you go, it's, it's like going to an OU football game and getting to the football game and sitting with a group of people who, who are like the other, from the other team. And that's why it's really not a good idea to like mix everybody up. Because sometimes, you know, like, and, and I'll tell you where it's real bad for those of you who don't know. Does anybody know the worst fans in the country? Philadelphia. Absolutely, Philadelphia. Philadelphia the fans there beat up Santa Claus one year. <laughs> But, but there's something about being in a place where, where, where not only are you not welcome, but you're on the other side. So that's why y'all can't be going around the enemy all the time thinking everything's going to be cool because it's not. Because he sees your jersey. He sees what you're wearing, and he's not about to cut you a break. So being around others matters. Coming together and attending church together, it matters. Gathering together matters. You get strength. You get perspective. Listen to this. Acts 2, 4, Acts 2, 42. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And all came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and, and distributing the proceeds to all as they had, as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food and, glad, and with, with gladness and generosity, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number uh, day by day for those who fasted. So in, in the word of God in Acts, after Jesus went off the scene, the disciples came together, and this is how they got by. This is how they made it through. They made it through by relying on one another. See, for many of us, we can't make it through by ourselves. For many of us, we can't do it all alone. For many of you, that's the problem is you've been trying to do it alone. You seem to believe that your situation is so unique and so different and nobody has been through anything like you've been through. You seem to believe that your, your situation is so unique and so different and no one has suffered as much as you and nobody can understand everything that you've been through. And so you set yourself over in a corner because the, I'm going to sit in the corner where the only people can understand me are and, and, and I'm the only one. But I got, I got news for you today. When you come together and you assess Assemble yourself together, you find that we have more that unites us. We have more in common than you possibly can imagine. Just because my name, just because mine's was named Judy and yours is named Margaret, trust me, there are similarities. They may have different names, but I promise you that people don't have many of different, uh, they don't have different tricks. It's about the same. Maybe his name was Mike and your name, your, yours was Gerald, but I promise you the same shenanigans that Mike pulled, Jerry probably did too. And, and, and John and Jim and everybody else. Uh, people are not that creative. But we set ourselves over in a corner to, and, and we feel sorry for ourselves, but when you assemble yourselves together, you, found, you find out that not only is somebody else going, going through it, somebody else has been through it, but somebody can give you encouragement on how you can get through it. Oh, well, here's what you need to do. See, some of us, you can't tell us anything. Some of you don't want to be encouraged. Some of you want to be a hermit and to sit by yourself and, and, and not let anybody else help you move through it. But if you really, really want strength, if you really, really want to grow, if you really, really want development, then you need to come together. The beauty of coming together is a camaraderie, having things in common, having shared beliefs. There are powerful benefits of, of coming together. But I know I get it. I know all y'all are thinking it. 
you're sitting there going, yeah, but what about the bad parts about coming together? I know. I know. Having to wait in line at the bathroom, the long lines to get to the food stands, the parking lot and the long walk up to the building to the stadium. Those super fans out there who are just really obnoxious, and especially when they start drinking. I get it. But look, there's always negatives anytime you deal with people. People are just people. And as long as we are in flesh, we're going to have issues. There are going to be things that you don't like about what somebody else does or says. And there's going to be things that they don't like about what you do or say. But here's what I need to tell you. The good news is at this church, there are multiple bathrooms and you rarely have to wait in line. At this church, there is no food or concession stands, so I can confidently tell you that you will rarely have to wait to get food. In this church, when we do communion, we use grape juice and not wine, so I doubt that you're going to have to deal with somebody here in the congregation who is drunk. Unless, of course, they're drunk in the spirit, in which case, I don't know what to tell you. If they're, if they're drunk in the spirit, then you just need to let them flow. But having said that, I want to just look quickly at five benefits of coming together for worship. Five benefits for coming together for worship. Now, I haven't looked behind me to see what slides are up there, but aren't the slides cool, y'all? Yes. Right? Right? I spend, I, you know, I spend effort here trying to make sure, you know? And when I found the slides, they actually had people working out. And I was like, okay, I'm not going to use those pictures. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of put in my own pictures, amen, to kind of bring it some, some, some spiritual oomph to it. But, but I, I, I love y'all. And I want to give, give you an experience in God. And so I look hard for these things. It's important to me. You're important to me. And so I love this PowerPoint presentation, y'all. I do. I'm like, <laughs> I'm digging it. Anyway, so there, <laughs> there are five things <laughs> that I want to talk to you about today when it comes to uh, coming together for worship. Coming together, it does five things. And, and again, it, it does any number of different things, but I'm going to focus on these. It edifies, it strengthens, it focuses, it refreshes, and it enables powerful prayer. So let's take a look at each one of those quickly. It edifies. Edifies is the act of building up, the act of promoting one another's growth in Christian wisdom, piety, happiness, and holiness. 1 Corinthians 14 and 26 says, What then, brothers, when you come together, each one has a hymn, a lesson, a revelation, a tongue, or an interpretation. Let all things be done for building up. Let me, let me help for those of you who need a better translation of that. Let me give you a translation. It means when we come together, build one another up. Stop the gossiping. Stop tearing people down. Stop talking a bunch of nonsense. Stop focusing on a bunch of things that don't matter, but focus on building one another up. You don't know. Look past the smile and let the Spirit give you discernment to understand that sometimes some people, beyond their smile, they need to be built up. Some people are smiling because they're trying to stop from crying, and they need to be built up. Some people are, are, are giving you that smile because they don't know what else to do. Some people have been, have been lying so long with their face and the facade that they put on until the only thing they, they know how to do is just keep smiling because that's what they become accustomed to, even though it's not how they feel inside. 1 Thessalonians 5 and 11 says, Therefore, encourage one another. And build one another up just as you are doing. Encourage one another. Stop getting with one another and tearing down other folk. Stop getting with one another and talking about other people. If somebody has on a blue blouse and they should have had on a gray one, don't talk about them. Ask God to make them not colorblind. If somebody is wearing something that you don't think they should wear, pray for them. If somebody is, is talking about something you don't think they should say, pray for them. If somebody is looking a certain way or acting a certain way or, or behaving a certain way, if somebody walks in with a man that you, that you saw yesterday or last night with another woman, instead of telling everybody about it, pray about it. The Bible tells us to edify one another. 
And to become spiritually fit, we've got to get into being able to pray for one another, to edify, to build people up. The problem that we run into too often is is we're too quick to comment on people, trying to give them constructive criticism. The first question I have is, who are you? Who made you the expert? Who made you the the, the last person that that can comment on those things? The Bible tells us that that when we we go to one another, we need to consider ourselves ourselves just in case we're caught up in that fault. So when, you, when you're so quick to run out and tell everybody all about themselves, wait a minute, stop. Think about you and what do you do. I want to tell you all the time about how you need to stop doing crack cocaine. Okay, I get that. But before you say anything, ask yourself this question, what is my crack cocaine? But before you start advising me and telling me what I should and shouldn't do, wait a minute, hold it. Look at yourself. Start, start with you first. Start the inventory with you. Start the measurement with you. And then edify others. <clears throat> the majority of the time, when you have issues with other people, the majority of the time, many of us want the other person fixed. But I encourage you, starting today, when you have issues with other people, start with this prayer. God, fix me first. Fix me. Because here's what I can tell you. There's no relationship anywhere that is 100% of the other person. There's always something that you could have done differently or better. So start with yourself. And if you start with yourself, you're not going to be so quick to, turn, to, to talk about other folk. And what God is calling us to do is to edify. He didn't, he didn't cause us to critique I, I have not, I, I kind of I read this once or twice. I, you know, I've, I've become kind of familiar with this, with this particular novel. And nowhere in here do I see anywhere where the Bible tells us to critique one another. I don't see it anywhere in here where the Bible says that you need to critique your brother to make him right. And that's not what the Bible tells us to do. Even Christ said, I didn't come here to judge. I I didn't come here to judge y'all. I came here so that people can have life through me. Do people have life through you? The way you give people life is through edifying them, building them up, talking about good things. People in all of our lives, mine and everybody else's, we get plenty of negativity, plenty of it. People are so willing to give it to you. There's one saying that people say that just irritates me so much when they say, well, I I don't want to give you a big head. Why? What's wrong with having a big head? What's wrong with feeling good about what you did or what you said? What's wrong? Why is it that we can constructively criticize, but we can't give each other big heads? I want to build you up. I want to give you a big head. I want you to feel good about who you are and who God made you. Why? Because we are all beautifully and wonderfully made. Edify. Then the Word of God, it tells us another benefit of, uh, of coming together and assembling ourselves is it gives us strength, building up one another morally and spiritually and providing a place of safety, a place of protection, a place of refuge, and a stronghold. Heaven forbid people feel like they can't come to church and have a refuge. Heaven forbid they feel like they can't come here and find strength. When people come in and and they're in the presence of God, they should walk out empowered. They should walk out feeling like, yes, Lord, I I felt like I had a connection with God. I want to get to the point in my walk with Christ where when people come around me and deal with me, they literally feel the presence of the Holy Spirit within me. I want to get to that, not so that I can brag, not so that I can feel like I'm better than anybody, but I want to be at the place in God where when people come around me, they feel like they've been in the presence of the Holy Spirit. Because when I get there, that will be an indication that I am letting the Holy Spirit rule in my life versus me tapping down the Holy Spirit. First Thessalonians 2 says, 11th verse, For you know how, like a father with his children, we exhorted one another, each other of you, and, ex- and encouraged you and charged you to walk in a manner worthy of God. Like a father exhorted each one of you, and we encouraged you and charged you, that, that's giving you strength. That's saying you can do it. Yeah, it's hard. 
Yeah, it doesn't feel right some days. Yes, it's, you're being challenged to do more. Someone said to me the other day, I was having a conversation with someone, and they're like, oh, you know, Ken, you know, you, know, you need to do this, and, and, you know, you're the pastor, so, you know, you got to take the lead, and, you know, you got to do this. You gotta, and, and, and as they were talking to me, I felt myself saying, yes, Lord, you're absolutely right. What else would you have me to do? I, I, felt, I felt myself being strengthened by the words that the person was giving me, and that's how we should feel when we talk to one another. When you come to church, don't ever let anybody come here and leave without encouraging them. Let your last words to somebody be, no matter what goes on this week, you got it. No matter what happens to you, God's with you. As we are going through this life, stop focusing on yourself all the time and try building up others. Try giving somebody else a little bit of strength. Strengthening. The power of being uh, together, the power of, of coming together, the power of assembling ourselves together also means this, Ecclesiastes 4, 9 through, tw- two, through 12. Two are better. That might be a typo in, 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 in that. Because for those people who stay all, at home all the time and don't come to church, one is better than one. One is equal to two. Yeah, that that math doesn't work no matter what you do. Math is different than when I came along. When my kids were in school, it was already different. I can't even imagine what it is right now. But the last time I looked, one was not equal to two. One was not equal to many the last time I looked. You can't stay home and think that you're going to be able to have the power that you would have if you were with others. Two are better than one. And it goes on to say, because they have a good reward for the toil, for if they fall, one will lift up his fellow. And you got to think about that for a minute, right? It's just really literal. If, if you fall and you're with at least one other person, there's somebody that can help you out. If you fall into a hole, there's somebody who can say, wait a minute, let me get a branch. But if you fall into that hole and, and there's nobody around, there's nobody to throw you a lifeline, there's nobody to give you a branch, what you going to do? Many people are at home right now because they've fallen in a hole. They've allowed themselves to fall into a hole of depression. They've allowed themselves to fall into a hole of guilt, a hole of regret. And now they're in that hole and they don't have anybody to throw them a lifeline. You've cut off everybody from you and you've gotten rid of all relationships and now you spend your time at home. And even when you have an opportunity to go to church, you prefer to stay at home. But here's what I want to tell you. As long as you are there, then the, the word of God in Ecclesiastes, it can't help you when it says two are better than one. And I'm actually going to take it a little bit further, and I'm going to say, and this is, this is, this is Ken Gordon uh, editing a little bit, right? This I'm taking creative license. I'm going to say many are better than one. Even though you come to church and everybody at church you may not agree with, everybody at church you may not like, everybody at church you may not uh, uh, think that they're walking according to the Word of God, but there are people who are. Stop focusing on the negative. Stop focusing on what isn't happening and focus on what is. Stop focusing on the the negative side of everything. I keep telling you all, don't ask me if my glass is half empty or half full because it's neither one. My glass is all the way full, all the time. So when it comes to assembling yourselves together, you need to be around that kind of energy, that energy that says, if you fall, I'll catch you. There's a... A movie from years ago that I absolutely love, and the na- I can't think of the name of the movie right now, but it's, it's, it has burn in it, but it's Kirk Douglas is in the movie, and uh, in the movie, there's a guy who had been setting fires to firehouses, and yeah, that one, and he knew he was wrong, and at the end of the movie, he was about to die. He was dangling over this long drop where he had set a fire and, and then they were, the firemen were in there trying to do it. Um, and Kirk Franklin was, oh, not Franklin. <laughs> <laughs> Kirk Franklin, yeah, he's in a, he probably was in that movie somewhere talking about, yeah, so the fire is coming. Anyway, and so, 
Y'all didn't like my Kirk Franklin impersonation? No? All right. Anyway, um, but backdraft, that was the name of it. It's called backdraft. Uh, I thank Holy Spirit. Um, and so he was reaching, he was laying on the floor, he was reaching over, and he had the guy, you know, he was holding the guy, and the guy looks up at him, and he says, let me go, I don't deserve to live. And, and Kirk, Kirk, um, no, it's not Douglas, it's not Kirk Douglas. Goldie Hawn's husband, Kurt Russell. Kurt Russell says to him, if you go, we go. See, that's the power of assembly. That's the power of being together, is when you have that person that's holding on to you and that person who says to you, if you go down, we both go down, but I'm not letting go. I'm not letting you go. We have to have the level of discernment with one another that we have to see when people are hurting, and we have to be able to reach out our hand and grab a hold of them, and we have to be able to communicate to them, if you go, we go. If, if you fail, we both fail. If, if, if you don't have the right walk with Christ, we both won't have the right walk with Christ, and therefore, I'm not letting you go. I'm not letting you go out tonight and do what you think you want to do. I'm not letting you when that phone rings at 1.30 in the morning. I'm not letting you go over there when that person calls out to you and says, let's get high one more time. I'm not letting you go. If you go, we go. I'm going to be here and stand right here next to you and let you know that we together can get through this. And, and that requires that we stop focusing only on ourselves. And that's what assembly does. When you come together with others, it promotes the ability to stop just thinking about yourself. And to that end, coming together, it helps you to focus. The reason why we want to uh, come together and assemble ourselves together is it helps you to, to focus. And, and by focus, I mean to hold each other accountable and encourage one another to meditate on the things of God. Proverbs 27 and, seven, and 17 says, iron sharpens iron. Amen. Hebrews 10 and 24 said, and let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works. You see, sometimes you have to be that person that holds your brother accountable, that holds your sister accountable, that says, no, bro, don't, uh -uh, don't do that. You know you're not just going to go to her house and just talk. Uh -uh, don't do that. Nah, bro, don't do that. You got a good wife at home, man. Don't do that. Nah, man, don't take one drink. You know how one drink ends up being four or five. Don't, don't, don't do that. Nah, man, whatever you do, don't, don't, don't do that right now because that's not what God wants from you. And we find ourselves in places where, where sometimes there are certain people we won't call because they will hold us accountable. You be that person. You be that person that holds your brothers and your sisters accountable, not being condescending, not trying to tell them that you're better than they are, but trying to help them understand, let me show you the scar of when I messed up, when I did what I shouldn't have done, the mistake that I made, don't be like me. I don't want you to be like me and, and, and risk it all just for that. It's all the same. It's packaged differently, but it is all the same, y'all. Whether it's drugs, whether it's alcohol, whether it is sex, no matter what it is, it's all the same. It's sin and it separates you from God. What more do you need to know? I don't care how they dress it up. You can dress up a pig all you want, but when it's all over said and done, all the perfume and the bows, all of the, all of the, the cute little tutus and all of that, it's still a pig. You can dress sin up however you want, but at the end of the day, it's still sin, y'all. And we've got to be able to discern that and, and see what our, our brother or our sister is trending in that way. If you don't see someone in church and it's been one or two weeks, reach out to them. Don't reach out to them to get in their business. Reach out to them to invite them back to church. Hey, sis, I haven't seen you in a minute. Missing you at church. I hope you're coming next week. Focus. Holding one another accountable. The next thing that assembling together does is it refreshes. And I love this one because it says that, that there are things that compete for our attention and it leaves us spiritually dry. Some of us are leaves that are withering on the vine because we're associating ourselves with things that are sucking us dry. How many of you know that in our lives there are things that will suck you dry? Same things that will take all of your energy, all of your hope, all of your everything out of you. How many of you right now are thinking about a particular person? Because there are people in your lives that are vampires. They will just suck the blood of Christ right out of you. 
and you won't be able, you, you literally are going to be walking around with two holes in your neck wondering what happened and why all of a sudden you don't like the light anymore. That just came. Out. The Holy Spirit just bam. When the Holy Spirit came, ooh, and really that? I was, ooh, Lord. Anyway, there are things in our lives that will suck us dry. So there's something about coming together with others that will refresh you. First Corinthians 16 and 18 says, For they refreshed my spirit as well as yours. Philemon 1 and 7 says, For I have derived much joy and comfort from your love. You see, there are things that we can give to other people. Sometimes just being around a genuine smile can refresh you. Sometimes just being around people who don't want anything from you, just to love you, can refresh you. Sometimes just being around people that have no motive, no, no ulterior motive, they're not, tr they're not up to anything, they're not after anything. I, I, we get into this thing way too much of, uh, of giving people way too much credit. Let me tell y'all something. There are some people that are not as smart as you make them out to be. You make some people out to be Machiavelli. Like they're that calculating. Uh-uh, they're, 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 they're not that. There are some people literally that are just not that smart. There are some people also that are literally just that lazy. They're not going to sit back and put together an, an, an immaculate scheme to try to get over on you. We got to stop living a life thinking everybody's playing gotcha. Living a life thinking everybody's out to get you. Living a life thinking that everybody's after you. Everybody is not after you. Some people don't even care about you. They don't even care that you're alive. How can they be after you? Christ is the one who thinks about you every day and loves you every day and who wants the best for you. He's the only one who's thinking about you every day in everything that you do. Even the enemy is not, he's not thinking about you. He's only thinking about you when he sees you doing something that's going to mess up his lie. He comes to kill, steal, and destroy. When he sees you trending towards messing up something he's trying to destroy, that's when he'll come at you. Some of you haven't heard from the enemy in years. That's because he's not concerned about you. You're not doing anything that is just, you know, that's bothering him. Keep doing what you're doing. You're not, you're not attracting anybody to the kingdom of heaven. You're not giving anybody any invitations there. You're not recruiting for the kingdom of heaven. Why would he bother you? You're trying to stay home and do church. You're not trying to let your light shine. You're not trying to strengthen others. You're not trying to refresh others. You're not trying to hold others accountable. So why would he care? And then the last thing. And if, not, if none of those four register with you at all, if none of those four uh, resonate with you in any way, if none of those four just uh, really spoke to you, that's okay, I got this one. This last one that if, if you don't think about anything else, I need you, if you're at home and you're a homebody churchgoer and you don't want to come out anymore and you don't want to come and assemble yourselves together, I need you to think about this. The Bible tells us that by coming together in prayer, that it is a spiritual journey and it is part of doing life together. And that when you come together, you strengthen one another. Matthew 18 and 20 says, for where there are two or three gathered together in my name, I am there in the midst of them. Why are people thinking that they can pray on a solo prayer and have power? The Word of God, and this was, this, by the way, if you turn to your Bibles, this right here is in red lettering, because this is Jesus talking, where two or three are gathered together. There is power in prayer, in coming together, in getting on the same accord, in getting somebody else to pray with you. That's why I tell people all the time, don't fast alone. Don't go on a fast by yourself. You're not going to have the power you need. Fasting brings power. Fasting takes the Holy Spirit and it gives them five and it gives it five hour energy. Fasting gives uh, the Holy Spirit steroids. It just activates it in a way that you just can't even possibly imagine. But you only do that when according when you when you activate that plus other scriptures. See what you do in the Word of God is you don't make any one scripture stand by itself. You, you, you kind of layer the scriptures. And when you layer the scriptures together, then that's where the power comes from. Because God's written word, logos, and his spoken word comes out. And, and that spoken word comes to you. And you layer it together with God's written word. And then from that comes that power. 
The power of God is in two or three, coming together, touching and agreeing, praying together. If for no other reason, you should want to make sure that you are assembling yourselves together because you need power. And I got news for you. The enemy is on a rampage right now. He's on a rampage, and, he, and, he, and he's doing the most. That's, that's my way of reaching the college students with my lingo, you know, I, <clears throat> because I'm lit, just so you know. <laughs> but, but the bottom line is that he's out there, he's attacking like never before. These are the end times, these are the end days, and we have to understand that and know that. Stop thinking that, oh, well, it's just another time frame. No, it's not just another era. These are the end days, wars and rumors of wars. Mothers against their daughters, daughters against their mothers, sons against their, their, their fathers, fathers against, against their sons. These things are, are, are prophecies that are played out in here that let you know that time is winding up, y'all. We don't have time to be playing around like, 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 like it's just, like it's not going to happen. Coming together gives you the ability to have powerful prayer. If you have something that you need from God, if you're hurting, if you need deliverance, if you have things going on in your life, you will never find deliverance by yourself. You just won't. Even the Word of God tells you in another layered scripture that you should call for the elders of the church to pray for you if you are hurting, if you're in pain, if you have need. I'm talking, I'm talking to y'all right now on the camera. I want you to understand there are some people that are home because they don't have a choice. There are some people that are home because maybe they're, they're sick today or they're not feeling well, but they, they come on a regular basis. But there are some people who haven't stepped foot in a church in years. I'm talking to you. I'm talking to those of you who don't believe in regular church attendance. I'm talking to you because as much as you're watching God on TV, you are not getting the real experience of God. And you won't get the real experience as long as you cut yourself off from the family of God. All of our families are flawed, y'all. All of them. I have two very flawed sisters. I <laughs> And they have an amazing brother. <laughs> but every family is flawed. Stop thinking that the church family is any different, y'all. Stop thinking the church family doesn't have humans in it and people that have flesh. Stop thinking that we are just so different than everybody else just because we can speak in tongues or just because we can dance or just because we can lay out on the floor and froth in the mouth. It doesn't make us better. Connecting with God doesn't make you better than anybody. Being called of God to preach his word, to be called the pastor, doesn't make you better than anybody. It just means that you have a different assignment. But I can't do my assignment if y'all don't do yours. If you don't do your assignment, then I don't care who I am, I won't be successful. I won't be fruitful. Someone reminded me the other day, they said, you do realize that sheep beget sheep. The shepherd doesn't beget sheep. Matter of fact, it's unnatural for the shepherd to be trying to beget sheep. He's not supposed to be doing that. It's the sheep that beget sheep. The shepherd is supposed to lead them, keep them out of trouble, make sure the wolves don't get them. The person reminded me, sheep beget sheep. It's those in the church that talk to their friends. It's those in the church that, 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 that encourage one another, that help other people get focused, that pray with, uh, with one another. See, because if, if the only thing this church has is that you like me, then, then we're top-heavy, and we're not going to make it. You have to be able to come here and say, not just the pastor, but, oh, his wife, she, she's just an amazing woman. And oh, that children's church they got at the House of Light Church, they call it Camp 1914. I want my kids in that. 
And oh, let me tell you about their praise and worship team. It's anointed. It may not be 137 voices, but it's anointed. It sounds like it is every Sunday. Oh, I'm going to tell you what. They be on live stream doing it too because they got a live stream person there who just, she knows exactly when to transition to the slides. And, and when she's not around, everybody knows it. And then not only that, but, but they also, they got young people in their church. It's not just them and like, uh, uh, like 10 other people who are 93 years old. They actually got young people up in there who actually come on a regular basis. They actually got those kind of people in that church. If it's just about me, then we're lost anyhow, y'all. Because if it's just about me, somebody's going to uh, uh, make the mistaken impression of thinking that I, got, I get it all right and I get it all right all the time and I don't. When you make it about just one person, then, 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 then you, you become very dangerously heavy. You don't want to come to church just because Ken Gordon is here. You want to come to church because there's a family here. You want to come to church because you feel love here. You want to come to church because you feel like you can really be yourself here. You want to come to church because you feel the love, because you feel the light. You want to come to church here because you feel at home. But more than anything, you want to come to church here because you, here's where you feel God. It's, it's not about personalities. Personalities are great. And, and, and all of us can, can, can usher in the Spirit of God, and all of us can make people feel love. But if they can't feel the Spirit of God speaking through them, then that's not where you need to be anyway. I was counseling a young man a couple of days ago who's having... He's engaged, and, he's, and it's nobody in this church, y'all. So y'all be like, mm, who's engaged in the church? It's nobody in this church. <clears throat> but I was counseling someone the other day, and I was saying to him that until you get to a place in your relationship where you feel that feeling, because he, he called me and he said, he said, I, 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 they're going through premarital counseling, and, and he called me and he said, I don't know if I'm ready for monogamy. And I'm like bruh, you bought old girl that huge diamond that she's wearing around and you don't know if you're ready for monogamy? I'm like, you do understand that monogamy equals marriage, don't you? Th those two are equal. If you're signing up for monogamy, if you're, if you're putting the down payment on marriage with that ring, then that means that you are, all, you are ready for monogamy. He says, yeah, you know, yeah, but, but uh, several other uh, of, of my boys have told me that, you know, it, it's really not mandatory. I said, okay, that's a problem. All right, that's a problem. I, he was, he was, he said, I'm calling you because I know you're going to give me truth. He said, they said, my boys said, and, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you exactly what he said, your wife and a side piece. And I said, I said, I'm glad you called me. I said, and not only that, I would love to have a conversation with them. Because, by the way, all of them are not young guys. Some of them are older. And I'm like, no, absolutely not. The thing about it is, is that when we're looking at spiritual fitness, and when we're looking at, at the Word of God, we have to look at the people that we surround ourselves with that pour into us. You can't, be physical, you can't be spiritually fit when you have people around you all the time talking about, don't go work out today. You can't be spiritually fit when you have people that are always offering you Krispy Kreme donuts every day. You can't be spiritually fit when, when, whenever you're ready to go work out. See, that's another one of the reasons. Have you ever heard people say that if you really want to get into shape, find a partner? That's true, all right? If you want to get into good spiritual fit, you know, if you want to be spiritually fit and get into good shape spiritually, find a partner. Find somebody that you can walk with, somebody who can encourage you, somebody who can refresh you, somebody who can focus you, somebody who will bring you along. We have to remember that as we look at spiritual fitness, that while we can stay at home and have a relationship with God, what God wants is your relationship in your relationship is a representation of a relationship with him and his church on earth. And that's us. That's people. And that's what God wants. God put us here to be together. God said from the very beginning, it is not good for man to be alone. 
did you think he wasn't talking about y'all laying up on Sunday morning and looking at TV and getting church? He wasn't just talking to Adam, y'all. He was talking to you who looks every Sunday at church by yourself and thinks that you are still spiritually strong. Can you have a relationship with God? Yes. Can you be chosen of God? Yes. Can you, can you call yourself a Christian or whatever name you want to give yourself, a follower of Christ? Yes. But you will not have that strength. You will not have that encouragement that you need. You will not have that excitement that you need. And when anybody says to you, Boomer, you won't know what to say. It's real. I hear way too many people saying, oh, I don't really need to go to church because I, I, I have a relationship with God. Okay, all right. But if you're looking for strength, if you're looking for God to show up in your life and move for you, if you're looking for a real connection with God, and if you're looking to fulfill what Christ gave us when he went off the scene, when he told us to go into the hedges and the highways and compel men to come, if you're looking for doing what God told us to do when he said that we need to love our neighbor, when you're looking uh, for what Jesus told us to do when he told us that we need to reach back and, and pull other people up, you can't do that in your home alone. Get out of your house. Get out of your bed and come to church and find the strength of the church together. Don't focus on the negative. Don't focus on who's not right. Don't focus on who judged you 20 years ago. Don't focus on who's not living the right way at, based on their, on their title or whatever. Don't focus on that. Come to church and focus on God, the one who has never failed, the one who cannot sin. If you keep your focus where it's supposed to be, you will not fall. If you keep looking up, you will not fall. Too many coming to church because we believe the devil is a lie. We believe that just because somebody hurt us way back when, that gives us a right to sit at home. It doesn't. Come to God. Assemble with his people and learn the joy of encouragement and power and excitement of this team. The team that God has made. And when you do that, then you will have fulfilled fitness tip number one coming together. Amen.